Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you guys had a good lunch. Um, so I'm, my name is Andre Confiado. I'm uh, working for the UN Environment Program. And I'm here to give you some insights from the work that we did under the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities. Um, and, base, and Aristide uh, uh, kindly invited us to give this presentation on learning from different contexts. So um, I have to say that I'm bringing in a little bit of a different uh, context here and um, providing a couple of examples from, uh, from two case studies that we did. So yeah, um, just a quick slide on why uh, the UN Environment uh, Program is working on cities. Uh, obviously, once again, as everyone said, I don't think I need to <laughs> explain that in this context. And um, so the initiative that, I, that, uh, that we worked on is the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities. So it's, um, it's a platform of collaboration and the idea was to implement the urban metabolism at city level. Um, this stems from the report of the International Resource Panel on City Level Decoupling and uh, the follow-up report on it on the weight of cities where um, we, it was, uh, the, the, the International Resource Panel was advocating for the use of urban metabolism at the city level. And so the Global Initiative for Resource Efficient Cities is a, it's a, in a way it's a networking platform as well for different professionals and academics like IRST uh, who are working on, um, on urban metabolism and at the same time we um, curated some uh, knowledge products, uh, one of the reports that was cited earlier um, on urban metabolism and at the same time, we also did some small pilot projects and seeing how we could implement this, um, especially in some developing country cities. <coughs> Next. Up. So um, these are some of the pilot projects that formed like the cornerstone of the GRec approach. And um, we engaged directly with the different cities and it, it was in these cities where some of the gaps that uh, we identified. So we worked in, uh, in eight of these cities and um, the two cities that I'm going to present are the ones in Recife, Brazil, and the one on, well, it's over there, and uh, Sorsogon City in the Philippines. The goal of these uh, pilot projects was to provide practical assistance with some research analysis and policy tools that would enable uh, decision making and action. So just a quick uh, <coughs> summary of the intervention cycle that we did. So first, uh, we did some identification of the problems with some um, initial discussions with, um, with the countries and the cities, uh, engaging the different relevant stakeholders, um, as well as the community leaders and, uh, and community-based organizations, gathering data and so forth, um, recommending some approaches and validating and then it, it's a continuous cycle of, of revision and depending on, on the outcomes and how do we, uh, how cities would consider implementing these, uh, these recommendations. So the, this, this intervention cycle actually allowed for um, investigation of both vertical and horizontal integration. So we also discussed a lot with national level stakeholders, for example, in the Philippines um, and and also with uh, the different sectors from, uh, from the waste management um, companies, the water providers, et cetera, to ensure that the solutions that we're trying to uh, recommend are practical and useful for the city and the country and context specific and at the same time building capacity in places where the capacity is not necessarily there um, in terms of resources or in terms of, um, in terms of people. And of course, um, trying to make sure that the the entire process is participatory as well. So the, the first study is, um, <coughs> excuse me, the first case study we have is uh, Recife in Brazil and how we, we did some analyses that would help them in the formulation, like the continuous formulation of what they call the REC 500 or the their 100 year plan. Um, it's, there's something happening there. <laughs> so, um, it's called the 100-year plan because when they started, um, when they started thinking about it, um, there the, the the city was uh, going to well, it was they were planning to celebrate the 500th uh, foundation anniversary of the city in 2037. So it it started embarking on this ambitious plan 
um, a hundred year plan for the city's, uh, for the sustainable growth of the city in the next 100 years. And so it, it, it's, this plan is meant to be a living document. As you can see, um, it's continuously being updated. And they want the, the, city, the, the city of Recife wanted to make sure that um, the structures and the, and the work that they were doing and the proper management of the structures will result in a more effective and efficient flow of all city resources. <coughs> um, after working with them and seeing um, seeing their plan, one of the things that um, we noticed is that they did not have uh, an explicit target and a more rational use of resources. So they were, it's it was pretty important in a city that had a significant inequality in, in terms of uh, the delivery of basic services. Um, it's actually quite uh, eighty three percent. Um, only eighty three percent had access to water, but only thirty six point four percent had access to sewage collection. A lot of the data that was available in Recife, even though they had uh, a small data portal, um, a lot of it was at the aggregate level, and we needed to try to figure out how to get a, a more granular level of data. And so one of my colleagues uh, at UNEP developed a sort of simple transition scenario um, tool that he called the Spatial Micro Simulation Urban Metabolism Model. It has a terrible acronym called SMUM, so if anyone has can figure out a better acronym for it, we're all ears, we'd, we'd love to get a better acronym for it. <laughs> and so the idea was to, um, to simulate uh, intervention, so policy interventions on the delivery, to, delivery of electricity and water. So these interventions are supposed to capture not only uh, built infrastructure for basic service delivery, but also different policies that we can put into place to regulate electricity and water use and delivery um, by the city. So just say, okay, uh, maybe perhaps you would like to reduce, uh, we want to aim to reduce electricity use by 20% in, in, in the city. What, what would that look like? And so the, the model created a, a synthetic population um, to represent the, um, the actual population and, and also looked at the current consumption of water and electricity. In, in terms of the type of uh, home construction in, in the city. So either it was either in apartments or detached houses, so individual houses. And this was actually quite um, relevant in the end because a lot of the people living in, in Recife were living in detached houses. So they would, um, the density, uh, uh, the number of people per house was actually pretty low. And so, um, through this uh, simulation um, program, this basic simulation program that we did, um, this is what we came out with. Uh, the blue is the, the business as usual baseline scenario and the orange one is the, the transition scenario showing very minimal intervention. Um, but the, the, orange, the orange line did not include any resource efficiency measures. And so this is actually one of the main um, conclusions that that were that were seen during the during this very uh, small study is that there is a large increase in that would still be required in resources because of the expected population growth, um, and that the city would have to input some resource efficiency measures if if they would be able to respond to the delivery to the services that the the population is uh, requires, and so this was something that we put forward to the city because this was not initially included in their 100 year plan. And so th the aim of the study was to demonstrate the potential and necessity of resource efficiency measures. Um, and that's what we were trying to prove in, in, the, in the scenarios that, we, that, that, my, that, uh, that were developed by UN Environment Program. We, we use some synthetic data uh, as a stand-in for the raw data to provide numbers for the decision making. And we tried as much as possible to use data to, that was downscaled actually to the city level uh, that would be available in, in most national level, uh, the national level data and combine that with, uh, with the demographic data. Uh, that's how the, sim the simulations were done. And so the idea was uh, for to, to include these resource efficiency plans um, 
to the REC 500, so the, the 100 year plan for the city. And these, these analysis would provide an opportunity to integrate um, these resource efficiency measures and at the same time have the marginalized households actually to be a little bit more visible. I'm saying that because a lot of the there's a lot of um, inequality in the in the city of Recife in terms of um, access to services, and people who are living in individual houses were actually getting more of the services, and and the others were not. And this this allowed the city to have a, an initial snapshot of what was happening, and in terms of resource consumption in the city, and it actually allowed. Um, the city to start considering the, the 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 flows of their resources, and now they're looking specifically uh, also in terms of construction materials for the different uh, for the dis different uh, construction that they're doing right now. So it was, to be quite frank, it was, it was a lot of it was just um, to to open their eyes to to how uh, the urban metabolism framework and how a resource flow analysis could actually help them in terms of their long term planning, and that was actually one of the one of the main uh, conclusions and outcomes of this of this initial uh, case study. So now, um, the second uh, example is we're going into a different context here. Um, it's uh, Sorsogon City in the Philippines. So, uh, if you may have noticed, um, these two examples that I'm using are also secondary, so small secondary cities in um, in uh, Brazil in the Philippines. I just looked at it really quickly, uh, secondary city in Brazil is about 1.6 million people. <laughs> and uh, this one for the Philippines, it's still relatively small. It's only 170,000. Um, but it's defined, what they call it, it's defined as a second class component city. So the Philippines has this uh, classification in terms of uh, city income. So it's not that it's like second class in terms of you know these are priority cities, but it's 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 ranked in terms of in terms of uh, local revenue. So it's um, I, I put there as well that this is a, a partially urban city because um, a big chunk of it is actually farmland. So in the Philippines, the cities are subdivided into these local um, sublocal divisions called barangays. Uh, so it's like a neighborhood but ha that has an actual um a structure with an elect like a small elected government um for each barangay and so if you if you can see there only 18 of them are classified as urban and the other and and the rest are classified as rural so it's a lot of it actually this within the administrative um, boundaries of the city it included a lot of farmland and one of the things that um, the city was actually trying to um, tackle is their, the, the threats to the quality of life of the citizens of the city due to the rapid urbanization that was happening. So um, I don't have the specific numbers in terms of um, urban growth, but um, these, was one of, these were one of the things that the city um, identified as one of their main issues. So just a, a quick... Uh, show of what the methodology was done in terms of the in terms of the study and through the different stakeholder consultations and the discussions with the government uh, the local government I mean the the resources that the project concentrated on were both were water and food so initially we had uh, we had also buildings and construction materials and energy and but we specifically uh, concentrated on water and food because one the city identified a lot of uh, water losses in terms of um, a lot of water losses, which, which was affecting the service delivery of the city to the to the inhabitants. And at the same time, um, since it is a lot, it is a lot of farmland, a lot of food, and specifically rice. Um, this is this is Asia after all, so it uh, requires a lot of uh, we they eat a lot of rice, and that also entails that it needs a lot of water. And the two are very much linked together when we started doing the study. And just wanted to identify that initially the, the city government thought that the, the water losses were due to informal settlers that were pilfering the water from the, from the, soup, from the systems that the city was getting from their, uh, from their water sources, which they called the, the watersheds. And so initially the city had identified these informal settlers as the reasons for the water losses. Just something to keep in mind. 
And so I, I just wanted to show you these, um, these two maps that we did. So water usage in the city uh, ranges from irrigation to, uh, to power generation. And it all even ends up to, to tourism and, and, and aquaculture. And here on the left, I actually just wanted to show in terms, these, these were the, um, these are the watersheds or the sources of water for, this, for the city. And, and the Sankey uh, over there on, on the right is actually the, the water flow estimations for one specific watershed, which is the Tikol Kawayan, which is this blue one. And this entire blue one provides 20% of the, of, the um, of the city's water. And so it was through the, uh, through the study that was done and, and, uh, and, the, and the resource flow analysis that was done that in, which showed that actually the surface water that was taken from, the, from, the, from that specific sub-watershed, almost all of it, a big chunk of it, actually goes initially from hydropower and then it goes into the irrigation systems. But then actually a lot of it was, was lost. And so the study identified a major inefficiency in the irrigation system. And so it's practically 19, a little over 19 uh, million cubic meters from, the, from that watershed alone. And this was something that was not initially identified by the city when they, did the, when they started doing their analysis in terms of their water losses. And um, as I said, the other thing, the other uh, resource flow that we wanted to look at was the food. And because the city, the, the vast majority of the city, two, over two thirds of it is still agricultural land. If you can see they're all basically all of the green that's within the administrative territory of the city, those are all the farmlands. And almost half of the, the, local, half of the local production is just rice. So it's uh, processed and semi-processed imported goods were the other half of the, of the inputs for the city. And so it, 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 it the, the nexus between the, the water and the food here was pretty, was pretty evident in terms of the rice production. And, and then obviously in terms of post-harvest processing, the requirements for electricity and fuel energy, which is still related to the water needs of the city because the, a lot of the electricity from the city is, is uh, from hydroelectric power. And so um, thinking about it, we were, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's just achieve water and food efficiency, but some of the policy recommendations and conclusions that uh, stemmed from this example was the, the, con the conservation, apologies for the mistake there, the conservation and rehabilitation of the sub-watersheds. Um, the, city, the city had actually started um, discussing with the national government on how they would be able to facilitate the, the conservation of their sub-watersheds. So they also started looking at their forest land use plan so that it would, uh, they would enable them to uh, also develop some natural areas for water catchment. Um, another thing is that they would have to start rethinking the farming calendar of the of the farmers in terms of when to harvest, when to when to irrigate, depending on on the on the season. So they they started also thinking about irrigation efficiency technologies and also water catchment areas for the rainy season, which is a uh, which is half the year in the Philippines. So it starts from between May and about November, October, November, and. Also, how to increase irrigation cover and reduce chemical fertilizers. So, coming stemming from those policy recommendations, actually, the uh, unfortunately the the mayor that we were initially working with was not voted back into office the following year. But these were some of the things that she that the mayor put into place. Um, some of the policy recommendations that she put into place um, that were actually that have started bearing fruit um, now in, 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 in the city of Sorsagon. So one was the rehabilitation of the sub-watersheds and the updating of the forest uh, land use plan. So the idea was to really ensure that the, the, forest and, uh, the, the forests were preserved in some of those areas which had the watersheds under them. And they started negotiating with the National Irrigation Authority of the Philippines to, um, to start co-financing some water catchment areas for this, uh, specifically within and in, in, in the vicinity of that specific watershed. And alternatively, they, they, this is the iron, like sort of quote unquote irony from what I mentioned in the beginning is that the city is now planning to utilize the budget to um, the budget that would have gone to 
the water catchments to at least relocate some of the informal settlers and try to provide them with um, with some decent housing and at the same time which would allow them to uh, to protect the watershed areas and co-finance some of the water catchment facilities and lastly the the city is also trying to uh, was strongly advocating the use of organic farming and uh, provision of free seeds for the farmers so that um, that hand in hand with the with the rethinking of the calendar they would they were also trying to to bring back some natural processes into the farming in, in that city and just uh, just a quick uh, just a quick note on what's next that's um, something that stemmed from from all of these different case studies that we did in um, in those eight cities that I showed on the map so one of the things that um, that stemmed obviously from it was the discussion and the narrative on circular economy uh, at the city level and something that we were looking at uh, when we were doing some of the work with our seed here in Brussels is who was we had these uh, circular economy plans but uh, a lot of the the frame the indicator or indicator frameworks that that we looked into that did not necessarily have um, indicators to show how it would how it would affect the quality of life and the, and the well-being of individuals for, during this circular economy transition so a lot of the plants had the had the had sentences or statements about uh, improving the quality of life of individuals but a lot of the a lot of the indicators that we looked at were looking at um, obviously the economy uh, materials but none of it was looking at well-being equality gender even and this actually got us thinking and this this stemmed a lot, this stemmed from the work that we were doing um, in during the, the the piloting of the GRec program and obviously this makes also a lot of sense for developing countries in terms of how to continue developing or you know should they should they even continue to grow or you know one of the things that we mentioned earlier in terms of should should the city continue to grow or do we, do, do we just go for a degrowth policy and so we were we started looking at that as well and so we're, what are, what are we working on right now is that um, so one of the things is how to ensure that marginal marginalized groups are not left invisible and one of the things that we we saw this that the jobs uh, the number of jobs that are created created in a circular economy could possibly be sort of like an like an anchor indicator but just a uh, just something that would show possibly that that the circular economy transition is actually benefiting marginalized groups. So we're currently working on that with uh, ICLE and Circle Economy, and Mariana's one of the people also working on that as well with us. And um, also bridging the data gap. So we're working on science-based solutions accessible to developing countries. So the downscaling of national level data, um, especially in developing countries, was actually quite helpful. Um, it, we did it in Sorsogon City. No, we did it in Recife, and we're trying to. We're still trying to develop this this methodology, so the SMUM method, um, to ensure that we could continue using the, these kinds of tools to develop the synthetic populations and develop simulations, so that it would be used as a basis for the decision making process. And that's it. Thank you.